Well, good evening, everyone, to the Lighthouse Fellowship Church here in Salina, Ohio. We've got our Wednesday night Bible study. And again, we are continuing on 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It's been a very good chapter. Lots of information. A lot of good detail that uh, has actually been quite interesting, especially getting into the, some of the traditions here. And uh, we're about... A little, a little over a third of the way. We're about halfway through the chapter right now. So this is a, a good thing to know. We'll see how far we get this evening. Continue on next week. Any questions, any feedback would be much appreciated. Send your questions this way if you're coming up there through Facebook. That would be wonderful. So let's go ahead and open our Bible study with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just... Thank you that we have a place to come and uh, worship you, a place to study your word, a place for the Holy Spirit to just uh, fill our hearts, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would have mercy on us, forgive us of our sins, Lord, and help us to do our best this evening to uh, present this message and to absorb the information that's in here. Help us, Father, to grow from these words and use it all for your glory. Heavenly Father, we just pray for those who are uh, not here in our congregation. We just pray for our, our pastors and their wives, Father, and we just ask, Lord, that you continue to watch over them, keeping a hedge of protection around them. We pray, Father, that you would keep them all healthy, safe, and prosperous, and guide them and direct their paths. And we pray for our other uh, congregation members who are or may be ill and struggling, Father. We know, you, Lord, that you are watching them for them and keeping them safe as well. And we turn over this evening to you, Lord, and just to direct our path tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to do a, a just a little recap here, um, starting on 1 Corinthians. We're going to go to verse 11. And just some of the information I have in here is that um, for verses 11 and 12, Paul was trying to, he was not trying to argue that men are superior to women. Again, this is a, a divine order by God who established uh, that having that he that God has established that has nothing to do with superiority. Uh, both men and women are equal from God's perspective, and but have independent roles. You know, spiritually we're all equal with God. So we we have two different sets here physically. Uh, women may be more superior, or men might be more superior physically, but overall, we're to work together as one in this case. Okay, our next part here, and uh, verses uh, 13, again, uh, judge for yourselves. It's proper for a woman to pray to God uh, with her head uncovered. We talked about, un you know, the head being covered or uncovered. Uh, it does not even... Uh, nature itself uh, to teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him. But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, uh, for her hair is given to her for a covering. And now we'll move on to verse 16. I bring this here, a reading from uh, King James. Verse 16 says, But if any man seemeth to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the church, churches of God. So God has designed uh, reproduction so that both, both man and... Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure I got that right. Uh, but both uh, man and woman are equally important to the process. It says, ensuring that no man can say it isn't, de isn't dependent on the woman and vice versa. Every man has a mother. Every woman has a, had a father. And, if it is, and in that way, uh, Paul says that we all trace our origins to God. But in the way God designed men and women, Paul says that we can see clear physical signs that God knowingly made men and women differently. 
men have traditionally kept short hair and women have traditionally valued long hair. These traditions have existed from Adam and Eve until today. And Paul says <coughs> these differences are, uh, were designed by God to reflect the differences in the family roles. Interestingly enough, I don't know. quite interesting. It says Christians are to strive for order within and among the churches. This is essential. Contention, chaos, confusion are not God's desire for his people. And part of that actually comes from uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and the first 16 verses through that. It says, A woman is glorified by having a covering. Men are dishonored by having a covering of hair. These things are tradition based on the physical differences. These things send a message about God's design for spiritual authority in the family. So the big question for us, do we still have an obligation to serve this tradition? Good thought there. The answer, the answer is depend. If we find ourselves in a culture where head coverings still carry the, this meaning, then we should observe the tradition. There are some places in the world and some Christian communities, even in this country, where these traditions persist. If we are in these settings, then Paul instructs instructions are fully appropriate for us. In many other places, though, the tradition meaning of head coverings has been forgotten. So I think many times, you know, we see head coverings and we see no covered heads all in the same setting. It says in here, so that today if a woman were to wear a head covering, few would understand its meaning. Now I remember going to church when most women actually came there with a you know a cap on or a shawl or something there for covering hair, their hair. I mean this is back in the 60s. I can't remember if it's still continued through the 50s, but I think many of those in that generation that wore head coverings uh, probably continued with that. More importantly, if a woman fails to wear a head covering, no one assumes that she is defying her husband's authority. Our customs have changed to the point that the tradition is no longer, long, no longer meaningful. I think a couple of weeks ago I was mentioning even we have head we got baseball caps. You know, it was always a tradition. The bill was always in front. Now you can get it to the side. You can get it behind you. It could be the right side. Uh, it could be a quarter turn to the right side. Um, or pants. You know, yeah. you didn't wear pants back in, you know, a long, long time ago. Oh, yeah. I remember when, you know, wore dresses. Dresses were a common thing. Now they're acceptable. Because they're women wear them now. You know, yeah. I consider a man, I think. Is it wrong for a church to maintain this custom? Hmm. You know, so some um, I've noticed some denominations, you know, kind of old order denominations, kind of carry these customs with that. Uh, I remember when it was appropriate that you had to wear a suit and tie to church. Now <laughs> you you come in your attire, you know, what you're wearing there. Kind of interesting. But in an answer to the question, it says, No, a church body certainly has the freedom to resurrect this tradition and asks women to observe head coverings out of respect for its meaning. On the other hand, other churches are equally free to pay no attention to the head coverings. Because the Bible, because of the biblical message of submission isn't being undermined, or excuse me, under. Yeah, I was right. Undermined in the process. Not every tradition can be set aside entirely. But I believe this is one that can be. From what the, the notes say in this. Again, I'm getting this information from a ministry called Verse by Verse Ministry International. And it's been quite helpful in the information we 
Okay, the message of wives living in submission to husbands will never change. So that's one thing that pretty well sticks with what the scripture has here. But how we choose to demonstrate that truth has and will change over time. If, if we are chained to the ritual rather than to the message, rather, yeah, rather than to the message, we are at risk of becoming slaves to legalistic rules, divorced from any meaning. Instead, we want to remain focused on the teachings behind anything, anything we practice. So I think that's really good that we are going through this material to really think, um, how committed are you to you know, the biblical principles in here? True, some of these were probably uh, written back in you know, the, uh, the Greek and Hebrew times with that. And then as time has passed by, some of these traditions have gone astray, but some of these traditions have actually been kept up. Okay, uh, we will continue on here. Actually, this is this finishes my first set of materials, so I brought my chapter 11, part B, with me tonight. So as we go through here, um, it says, Paul's discourse on liberty has led him into offering correction to the Corinthians how to conduct certain traditions and rituals within the bounds of Christian liberty. And I think uh, Pastor Richard mentioned something about liberty last week, and that this talks about Christian liberty, and so I think the Christian liberty has a lot to do with the freedoms we have as Christians. Uh, you know, we can realize that, and even in our own country, we do have uh, religious freedoms, but we also have to be on our guard, too, because if we don't speak up, our religious freedoms can begin to diminish and it can be done very subtly that we, we may not even notice it. So we really need to stay attuned to our religious freedoms that we have for, with our country. So specifically, there are two areas of beneficial Christian ritual that Paul expected the church to observe in keeping with them the word of God. Again, we're talking about the Corinthian church. So previously we looked at the, these rituals, uh, that, that of the rules of wearing and head coverings. In society of Paul's day, the, uh, the choice to wear or not wear a head covering conveyed a certain meaning. Again, for a man to wear the head covering in church meant he rejected the idea that he was under the authority of Christ. The head covering was a symbolic barrier between the man and Christ. So if a man chose to wear a hat knowing the culture stigma, then he was choosing to bring shame to Christ, Paul said. Likewise, for a woman not to wear a head covering, she was communicating she was not submitted to her husband's authority for the, how the cultural uh, interpretation went for such behavior. Her head covering was a symbol that she recognized she did have an authority between her and Christ, that it is her husband. So if she gave up her head covering, she was claiming that she has equal authority with her husband, which brought shame to him. Okay, let's see if we continue on here. Uh, talks about back in uh, verse 10. In verse 10 here in the Bible, it was uh, speaking about um, if I get this on here. speaking about uh, for this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority uh, on her head because of the angels. Of that so here it talks about that uh, Paul says the woman must remember her place of submission because of the angels. He's reminding the readers of times in the past when a failure of a woman to cover, to be covered by authority, her husband uh, led her to be deceived by the angelic realm. Hmm, this is getting kind of deep here. Don't have too many answers on that one there as far as the angelic realm. 
It says, the woman in the garden and the women on earth before the flood of Noah were victims of sinful angels who took advantage of the women absent uh, women, advantage of women absent spiritual cover. Paul warns the church not to return to a state where women are without spiritual cover and vulnerable to the schemes of angels. It sounds like we're not talking about the good angels in this case. We're looking at uh, the angels of uh, Satan. It says, The messages associated with head coverings were culturally determined, and therefore there was no way for the Corinthian church to avoid them and dispute them. Paul explained that since the rituals had their source in, creation in the creation story itself, so their actions would either affirm or deny certain spiritual truths. The ritual declared that God created, a, created man as a reflection of his glory, that God created women as a reflection of man's glory. And the cultural practice of head coverings and of certain hair length or testimonies to these truths. Therefore, Paul urged the, truth, the church to respect these traditions so that, we may, so that they may be seen as standing with the truth rather than contradicting them. So today in our society, including the church society itself, no longer associated with the creation account with wearing uh, hats and scarves, generally men and women don't wear head coverings much anymore. Apart from sports caps, cowboy hats, anything else, skull caps. You know, we always used to call them stocking caps. Now they're called skull caps. Uh, I guess it's just a, a marketing ploy. That's my thought because they just like a stocking cap to me, depending upon what they're what's on it. <laughs> so when women, so when uh, we see a man remove his hat walking into church. We interpret that as polite etiquette rather than as a testimony to the order of creation. Anybody ever have many thoughts on that? Do you ever think, oh, we, we're, you know, he must be thinking about the order of creation? I, I always thought it was respect, respect. You know, just, just respect, respect for being inside there. If we see a woman without a head covering in church, we don't gasp at her rude display. <laughs> Therefore, we don't need to reinstitute the head covering practices Paul outlines in order in order to be compliance uh, with Paul's teachings, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Instead, we must respect and honor the spiritual message of these bygone rituals as as the Bible expects. Uh, we don't re resurrect the ritual. We look for the modern ways we can continue to communicate the biblical truth of headship. That's, that's a good point. A wife can show respect for her husband's authority in many other ways today, while a husband can likewise demonstrate leadership in the home and submit to Christ. Any questions or comments on that? Anybody on Facebook? What are your comments on, on this? <laughs> I'm going to try to include you in here. This, this would be good. Okay, but well, when we do these things, we are obeying the intent of 1 Corinthians. Ironically, it's, it's possible to reinstitute yeah, it's possible to reinstitute the behaviors of head coverings today without actually meeting the spirit of Paul's instructions. It says we act, he is asking us to maintain a tradition of living under headship and testifying that all that it represents in God's plan for the family. So the headship, we're not talking about head coverings, we're talking about the headship. We've got, we've got God who oversees Christ, Christ oversees the man, man oversees the woman, and then together with that. So there's the headship that we are talking about in that order. God is not concerned with what we wear on our head as uh, if, the, if that tradition has lost its meaning. To do otherwise is to elevate ritual above message, which is always unhelpful and often dangerous. Then we get into some, some bold print here. It says, a priest, a pastor, a rabbi decide to see who's best 
at his job. The test is to go into the woods, find a bear, and try to convert it. I haven't read this. This looks kind of interesting. <laughs> if they return from the woods, the priest says, I read to the bear from the, cate from the uh, catechism, sprinkled him with holy water, and next week is his first communion. The minister said, I found a bear by the stream, <coughs> preached God's holy word, and then let him baptize yeah, and then let let me baptize him in the river. The rabbi was bandaged from head to foot and said, Looking back, maybe I shouldn't have started with the, the circumcision. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. I guess it depends on your traditions you're gonna follow in there. That, that's pretty interesting. Okay. Well, moving on through this chapter, today we want to examine the second tradition of Paul that Paul raises. <laughs> Once again, the church is in danger of treating certain tradition with too much liberty, uh, which had an effect of damaging the spiritual message of the ritual. So Paul begins to introduce the problem. Uh, in their practice in verse 17. So we're going to read through verses 17 through 20 in this and, uh, and clear, to, clear to 22 and then we're going to start covering these verses individually here. 17 through 22. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not that ye come together not for the better but for the worse. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must all there must be also hearsays among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, there is not to eat, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in eating every one taketh uh, before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. What? Have ye not, house, have you, have you not houses to eat and to drink in, or despise ye? Uh, the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Okay, well let's take a look back in this and uh, see what Paul is going to comment on. Uh, we talked a little bit about um, these verses. In my uh, Jeremiah study Bible, it says in here, Tragically, during communion, or the Lord's Supper, an event meant to be at the very heart of worship was one of the places where the divisions within the Corinthian church were most evident. So there were some differences there within the Corinthian church, and so no wonder Paul's bringing this up. It says, as Paul moves into the 17th verse, he switches gears from the first half of the chapter, and you remember in the, the first verse that Paul began to praise, uh, began praise for the church. In the case of the head coverings, it appears that they had largely had, uh, largely held through the traditions, and perhaps some men or women uh, were questioning the tradition, which led Paul to reinforce it. Nevertheless, Paul pray, Paul's praise to tell us that. The church had largely held the line on the tradition of head coverings, which pleases the apostle. Now, in verse 17, Paul abruptly changes his tone to one of admonishing the church. So he says, in giving you this instruction, I do not praise you. That's where we get into the admonishing here. He means in giving you the following instructions. I am not pleased with you or with your behavior. So what falls to the end of the chapter is an abom abom uh, abomination uh, for how they have approached 
perhaps the most significant Christian tradition, the Lord's Supper. In fact, uh, Paul says in their practice of this ritual, the church is coming together for the worse, not for the better. The way the church has engaged in the Lord's Supper was so contrary to the intentions of the Lord that they were actually making matters worse that if they were if they never practiced it at all. Once again, Paul is referring to the meaning of the or the message behind the ritual. This behavior was sending a bad message rather than uh, communicating the good message the Lord intended when he instituted the practice before his death. Any questions or comments here? We're going to continue on now with verse 18. It says, Paul begins this outline uh, of what they're doing wrong as uh, they observe this meal. Some background here. It says, in ancient times, religious worship services usually included a lavish meal. The pagans and Jews incorporated a meal service into the worship meetings. So they practiced with enjoying a meal together. So practicing and, enjoy, uh, and enjoying a meal together was already a common uh, place in Jesus' day. The Lord's Supper was not unique in that respect. But, of course, it communicated something very unique and important. So it must be observed in a way that fits that purpose, the purpose of the Lord's Supper. It says the religious meals could be quite elaborate and even excessive, especially in the pagan setting. A meal was a main event. Most worshipers attended the service primarily for the meal. Just as many of you come to church primarily for donuts. Anybody? We don't have donuts here. We used to have coffee. I, that was kind of a draw there. I know some churches actually had, uh, they bring their donuts and cookies, and, you know, homemade at that. Um, we have a cappuccino machine over here. Um, you know, really made hospitality quite welcoming <laughs> with that. Uh, if it were not uh, for the meal, service would probably even, may not even happen. And in some, if you, if you ever noticed in our church, whenever we announce, okay, well, next Sunday we're going to have a meal in the fellowship hall, what happens? We get way more people there. We get more people there. Sometimes uh, the size doubles with that. So, you know, we're getting, we're getting two meals out of that, actually. We're getting the spiritual meal with the pastor giving the message that way. And then, of course, when we got the physical meal coming out of it that way. So, um, yes, you know, that's a side note, though. One reason why people used to eat at the services like that, traditionally, is because they had so far to travel back and forth from church right. to where they lived. Mm -hmm. So they would eat there, they'd make it all day thing, eat lunch there. And travel home afterwards. Right. That's one reason Good point there. Yeah. I'm sure there are a lot of con con maybe country churches that might do that. Um, oh yeah. Just because you know driving out. Well, back then the people there. drove horses, and buggies, and took a little while right. to get home. You know. Mm -hmm. and he took even longer if he's on foot. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Says furthermore, the worshippers were expected to. Uh, contribute to the food of the meal. <clears throat> Though uh, the bringing uh, of a sacrifice animal. Yeah, through bringing a sacrifice animal. It says, though the food was shared to a degree, it wasn't a perfect fair system. If a rich family brought a, uh, a choice animal, they might set themselves apart from the rest of the crowd to ensure that they ate the better meat. Well, a poor family who, who contributes something less would have the lesser food. Well, a poor family uh, contributed something uh, less, uh, so this resulted in divisions within the worshipers that reflected a class system in society. Okay. Interesting. Since Paul's comments suggest that the Corinthian church had begun to follow these societal traditions when they practiced the Lord's Supper in the church. And as we know, as most Christians, the Lord's Supper wasn't quite a class qualification in there. Everybody was equal. 
So in verse 8, Paul says uh, there are divisions <coughs> reported among the people. This division is so different in the, in the one Paul mentions in chapters 1 and 2 of this uh, letter. In the earlier case, the divisions were uh, the result of a desire to gain status by association with various apostles. You know, and I, I think in some of the, the churches in our community, I think there, there could be a status uh, in there. I know in some places, you know, you may find you know, more doctors, more teachers in one area, and then uh, smaller churches may have uh, the lesser on that. I mean, it, it, you know, if we look at the church as a church body, as a whole there, each person has a, has a responsibility. And I think sometimes our churches need to kind of take sit back and take a look and find out that, you know, everybody's there regardless of what your societal position is as a doctor, as a, a teacher, as a truck driver on that. Uh, I think we all need to realize that uh, in, within the church we all are given a responsibility and God gives us various different talents. He doesn't say because you're a doctor you're going to, want, you're going to be, you know, having a more, more responsibilities with that. So, I, you know, sometimes money can push a church and I think that's some struggles that uh, churches may get into with that and if they're relying on money they're not relying on God yeah. can't take it with money less. right and this this gets into the next uh, bullet point here it says in this case the division relates to the wealth and the selfishness of the worshipers the church had to refashion uh, the Lord's Supper into a meal like the kind of practiced as in the pagan temples. It says, first Paul says in verse 19 that the church was maintaining divisions during the meal in order to meet clear uh, who approved, uh, who was approved among them. It says, Paul's, uh, yeah, Paul means that the divisions were instituted by the wealthy so that their superior socioeconomic status would be evident to everyone in the body. Now it says if you, if we receive uh, a gift and it's, and it's acknowledged in public, then many times God's not going to acknowledge that gift. But if it's acknowledged privately, you know, God will bless that gift. And I'm not sure exactly where the verse is on something like that, but um, I think many times we need to kind of try to refrain from <laughs> It's about um, not public letting, image. Not letting the right hand not the left hand does. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that is. Yeah. yeah. That's what I think that's what he's referring to, doing things privately. Yeah. Okay. What a blessing is it when you come out and tell everybody, oh, look what I did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> look at all this. Yeah. That's it. Yep. You'll be praised right there. And <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the further it. it'll go. Yet you're praised yeah. by men and not by God. And they were refusing to share the food within the uh, poorer members of the congregation. Notice in verse 22, Paul says, They despise and shame those who have nothing. Apparently, some of the poorest believers would come to the gatherings without any food. So they had nothing to eat when the Lord's Supper was practiced during the service. It was BYOB, bring your own bread, wine, or have nothing. That's an interesting point there. Therefore, Paul says they are coming together for reasons other than to observe the true meaning of the Lord's Supper. They are coming together to show off, to enjoy a big meal, and get drunk and have a party. These purposes have nothing in common with the purposes of observing the Lord's Supper. So the ritual Jesus gave the church had a specific purpose and message, but when the ritual is distorted, then the message is distorted too. Or simply to say, the message is lost with that. That's why Paul said that the way that they were practicing the ritual was doing more harm than good. He was sending a worldly message, the message, uh, not the message Jesus brought. He was testifying 
to ungodly, fleshly, sinful things. Imagine what an unbeliever living in Corinth might have taken away from watching the Christian practice of the Lord's Supper in exactly the same way the pagans were practicing their meals. They would have no concept of what truly the Lord's Supper was. They couldn't have helped but think there was nothing new in the Christian message. Uh, verse 22, again, uh, Paul asks rhetorically, don't they have homes where they have, their, where they have their meals? In other words, the church service is not intended as a restaurant experience. Since we are not supposed to take the ritual of the Lord's Supper and equate it with the normal everyday meal opportunity. A church is not free to take the tradition of the Lord's Supper and play with uh, the form beyond what's given. Unlike the tradition of wearing hats, this tradition was prescribed by Jesus in a certain form with a certain message. So, I, I, you know, much like the, the head coverings and not covering your head, uh, those things are traditions. Uh, are they, you know, is it something that you would tell a person not to do? Probably not. I think deep down, if that person, you know, was trying to show respect, and that's how they were brought up in showing respect, I think it should be honored and not disgraced with that. Uh, so it can kind of go both ways. But we've got the Lord's Supper, and it's specifically something, like it says in here, Jesus prescribed, then it needs to be followed as Jesus prescribed it. As an earlier example, the form of wearing a hat to testify headship arose out of human culture. There we go. Human culture. But, not the but the message was timeless. But in the case, both form and message were prescribed by the Lord. So we do not have the latitude to change it beyond a few details. So Paul says that we can't praise the... You know, that he can't praise the church in this case, unlike the example. No, in this case, he says he will not praise them. Which is to say, he is chastising them for their poor behavior. In this case, they were getting into debt, you know, showing a class system there that really wasn't accepting the poor in this matter. It says, you may remember that we're the earlier in the earlier lesson that we learned the meaning of the word admonish, it means to the combination of a rebuke with correction. So as Paul was now offering uh, the rebuke for their bad behavior, it's time for him to offer a correction. So Paul now, yeah, now Paul is going to remind them for the proper observance of the Lord's Supper tradition. And this is where we get into verses 23 through 26 in this case. But I think we've got plenty of time here to cover that. Okay. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 23. For I have received of, Lord, of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And we, when he had given thanks... He brake it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he also took a cup, took the cup when he had soup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do shew the Lord's death till he come. Okay, so first Paul reestablishes that the model for this meal is prescribed both in form and in a message. First Paul um, states here that the, the Lord himself gave Paul, the form he expected his church to observe, 
as they obeyed his instructions. And Paul says he delivered that form to the church faithfully. It's this statement that tells us we cannot change the form of this tradition. It makes no difference what happens in our culture over time. It makes no difference whether the cultural culture understands what we're doing. Since Jesus told us to do this, do it this way, we must not change that form. So the Corinthian behavior, Corinthians' behavior amounted to sinning against the Lord himself. And then Paul begins to relate uh, what the Lord passed along with, uh, with him. So if you remember, this letter was written before any of the gospel had been written to the church. So in this account, it preceded the writing of the gospel's accounts of the Last Supper moment. That makes this record so important that to the early church, and it explains why Paul put these instructions in writing here. Let's see here. Uh, in one of my footnotes in here, it says, states here that uh, the, Corinthi the Corinthians had forgotten that they were gathered for this meal. They used it for uh, revelry and political announcements, causing division. The purpose of the Lord's Supper is to consciously call uh, to mind what Jesus was doing for his own in his death on the cross. The focus needs to be on him. It says, when uh, believers partake together in these elements at the Lord's table, the bread and the cup, they proclaim this ritual meal which should be the most uh, eloquent sermon preached. As the body of believers look back in, at what Christ has done and look forward to his return, this meal is a time of rejoyous unity, reflection, and anticipation until he comes. Interesting there. Okay. Um, it says the setting of the meal is central to how they... The setting of the meal is central to how and why we practice it today. Jesus was prepared to die on the cross. He knew he would die, and he knew how he would die, and he knew he had to die. The apostles were largely ob oblivious uh, to all these things. So Jesus used the occasion of the Passover meal on the night before he became sacrifice to institute a ritual that would forever after explain his death. Therefore, the meaning and purpose of the Lord's Supper is intimately connected to this moment, which means we can't approach the ritual in a casual or disrespectful manner. We can't honor the purpose and meaning of this ritual if we see it merely as an opportunity to eat a dinner. The Corinthians' practice had stripped the seriousness and the importance out of the ritual, rendering it, me rendering it meaningless. Okay. Oh, we're still going here pretty strong. Next, uh, Paul relates to the steps of the ritual in keeping in the steps uh, Jesus took on the first night. First, Jesus took the bread, blessed it, and gave thanks. So they took the bread uh, from the Passover table, and this step was not a step of uh, normal Passover. It marked the departure from the Jewish tradition. So Passover was always a, tr a Jewish tradition, so what Jesus was doing was actually separating the two. It says that it tells us that we purposefully, uh, that this was purposefully interruption an interruption of the past things and the instituting of new things. Secondly, he announces the meaning of these symbols as they were used in the new ritual. The bread will forever after be a symbol, symbol of the body of the Messiah sacrificed on our behalf. And when we repeat the moment, we are doing it as a memorial of Christ's death and the sacrifice on our behalf. 
If like any memorial, we practice the ritual to ensure we never lose sight of the meaning of past events. <coughs> uh, I, I, I don't want to sidestep. I'm going to keep, I was going to talk about something else here at death, but I thought, oh, let's, let's stay focused on, on this. It says, thirdly, uh, interrupted the, Jesus interrupted the meal again to take a cup of wine from the table. And he creates another symbol by equating the wine to the blood of Jesus will spill to forge the new covenant. Like the writer of Hebrews teaches us, every covenant of God is formed through blood. If you ever read through the Old Testament, uh, I've been reading, reading through the book of Jeremiah, and it talks a lot about uh, the covenants <coughs> and all the situations in which the Jews, uh, they were you know, just obliterated. Of that, we're just with a small remnant of Jews were, were left on that. So there was a lot of blood sacrifice to the Jews on that. And so, you know, a covenant was developed. You had the Davidic covenant, you had the Abrahamic covenant, just to mention a few that come across my mind here. So he's right here. It's almost important that all covenants were formed through the spill, spilling of God's own blood. Now, so there we're getting into Jesus. It says, we are commanded to drink of the fruit of the vine as a symbol of Jesus' blood poured out on our behalf. And then fourthly, Paul explains Jesus' expectations for the frequency of this ritual. Unlike other rituals that are practiced only once, like water baptism, or are practiced annually, like the Passover, this ritual happens frequently without prescribed period. Without a prescribed period. In verses 25 to 26, we are to conduct this ritual as often as we do. Okay, as often as we do. And in other words, not by a set schedule. The church is free to establish itself how often to observe this ritual. But it's understood to be done routinely. So I know... Uh, I think it was before the um, uh, when before COVID started here, we were doing it on like on the, the fifth Sunday of each month with that. And we may have to give some thought here about getting that back in again because we've had I think we've had at least one or two Sundays that have had fifth Sundays. And, uh, There's a fifth Sunday this month. This month. I won't just okay. <laughs> I was wondering if we were going to have a communion right. service then. So, well, we'll see about that. October, who gave? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, again, the day, you know, the, the Lord's Supper, I know some, some churches do it monthly. Uh, some churches do it every Sunday with that. So, um, well, we'll look into that. I think it's something that we saw on Halloween. Huh? The fall on Halloween. How old say it's there? Okay. Well, finally, Paul sets forth the message Jesus wanted to communicate by practice. Uh, the message was proclaimed. We, we proclaim as twofold. First, first, we were proclaimed that Jesus died to free us from our sins. The elements of the meal stand as a reminders of his sacrificial death. Every time we connect the meal, we declare bread to be representative of the body and wine to be representative of the, of the blood to remind us that a death was required for sin. Secondly, we proclaim that death is not... Uh, was not conquer Jesus. Let me read that again. We proclaim that death did not conquer Jesus. Jesus conquers death. Amen. It says, we are conducting this ritual as a temporary ordinance. It says, it, is a, is, it will not carry forth into the kingdom after Jesus returns. Jesus says in verse 26 that we are to observe this tradition until he returns. 
right there. I don't know if while I was reading that, I really didn't think of that as far as how long do we carry the, the Last Supper. And here it is. We are to carry this tradition until he returns. So the message we are to convey as part of our, observa our observance, that is that Jesus is returning and we're eagerly looking forward to that moment. So we should be excited and really worshiping the Lord when we participate in that Last Supper. In light of that message, we need to observe the meal with, with a balance of sober reflection and joy and anticipation. We should conduct the meal with a yeah, we should conduct the meal with a sour face and in a joyless uh, mechanical fashion that may be communicated that they may be communicating death, but a, it certainly doesn't reflect the hope and joy of a Christian's anticipation of the Lord's return. Since the point is to reflect on the need for a sacrifice coupled with a joy that the one and only sacrifice has been made. Again, the one and only sacrifice has been made. Now we have a hope that God's grace makes possible. Let us not slip into the mindset that assumes uh, we must remove all joy from the Lord's Supper. Says we just uh, need to guard against letting our joy become indulgence as the Corinthians did. To end this cor his correction, Paul now addresses how he wants the Corinthians to correct their behavior and observance of the meal. Okay, yeah, I think we'll stop here at that point on that. So uh, when we continue again, we're going to continue with uh, uh, verse 27, and then that will follow through, and we will we'll actually finish up uh, 1 Corinthians in that case, and then we can kind of review and discuss uh, what we've read, any key points on things that kind of stand out and what, what we've read from the first verse all the way up to the 34th verse, and kind of go from there. I have a feeling we'll probably run out of chapter 11 before we run out of time with that. So at this point, uh, well, let's go ahead and uh, close with any other comments anybody might have. Uh, any thoughts on the Last Supper? Okay. And we'll close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you uh, for this eye-opener, Lord, that uh, you have really uh, brought something new, more detail about actually what the Lord's Supper is all about. Uh, Lord, we know that the Lord's Supper is a, uh, a tradition, a ritual that Jesus put together, Father, and we pray, Lord, that we may not lose its meaning and what it symbolizes, Father. Father, help us not to be discouraged when human traditions are are used or you know kind of kind of fall away. But Father, help us to be in fine tune to what your uh, God made traditions are in the Bible. Father, help us, look, Father, to read in more detail about studying the Bible and reading your Word and seeking the nourishment we get from your word, Father. And we just thank you for the Holy Spirit opening up our hearts and minds to, to learn so much more. Father, we just pray with you be with those who are here tonight, Father, that you would guide them and keep them safe as we depart this evening. We pray, Father, for those on Facebook who have been listening to this message, Lord, and we pray that you would richly bless them, Father, with this message, guide them and direct their paths as well. And we just ask, Father, you would continue to keep us safe, and keep our faith strong, Lord, as we reach out into the mission field outside these walls. We ask all this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, folks.